Okay, so we're live. Thanks everybody for uh, for coming. And uh, yeah, so today's topic is fantasy cartography, and I'm hoping that science fictional cartography also also applies. Um, our our guest today um, is Christian Steele. Say hi. Hi. How's it going? Is that how you say your last name? Steele. Yeah. Steele. Okay, great. So. Um, so I know Christian just won a contest with a map that he made, so that's pretty awesome. And why don't you uh, tell us a little bit of how about, about how you got into map making? Sure. Um, <clears throat> I've always been interested in uh, maps. I remember uh, having National Geographic's when I was a kid and poring over the maps that came uh, with each issue and spreading them out and just uh, getting, getting lost in them. You can just... Um, kind of dive in and uh, follow rivers around and look at the interesting mountains and find all the cool places and then try to imagine what they're like and, or uh, look at the photos in the issue and see what it was actually like in that location. So it was, um, it's always been a thing and then you know getting into fantasy literature when I was uh, a kid my mom read The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit to me out loud and and I've passed that on reading it out loud to friends and family um, mm -hmm. and you know a lot of the fantasy novels came with maps for good reason and mm -hmm. um, so it was always uh, a fascination of mine and you know, I became a dungeon master when I was uh, 13 or so, back in the 80s, and so you make a lot of maps when you're creating adventures, and uh, there's always been maps in, like, uh, Dungeon Magazine, especially, uh, where adventures were published, and then amazing maps in some of the modules that TSR, uh, before it was Wizards of the Coast, uh, TSR would put out, like, especially the... Um, I remember the Castle Ravenloft maps, which were done by, I think, Dave Sutherland, who's, uh, I think, not alive anymore. But he did this amazing... <laughs> it's the first time there was really, like, an isometric map of a dungeon um, provided in a module, which made it seem so much more realistic. Um, you know, it was instead of a top-down, plain kind of uh, view that you would get from the old-school modules from the 70s, this is um, a side-on, sort of 45-degree angle view of the castle, and it made Ravenloft seem much more uh, evocative and um, hmm. got gothic and creepy and interesting. And so I've, you know, I've done other things uh, over the years, but I'm getting into uh, more of a creative space right now and um, starting to try to put out my own maps. And there are lots of great places to share them online now and mm -hmm. lots of uh, uh, communities where you can get feedback and get inspiration and uh, and even take on commissions and and make money if you're good enough if you're if you're into that sort of thing mm hmm so um, if you're interested in putting and sharing any of the online uh, addresses for that if you could put them in the chat bar then I can pick them up and put them in my report later yeah sure I mean, I don't want to distract you at this point, but... Uh. Well, one of, the, one of the sites that I've always been combing over for years now is cartographyguild.com, and uh, that's a place of people, uh, like-minded people, who do stuff for um, <coughs> both professionally for Wizards of the Coast or Paizo, uh, they do professional commissions for fantasy novels for authors, um, and they do stuff for free, um, for fun, and they're amateurs and professionals on that site. Mm -hmm. um, that's a, you know, it's its own independent site. And then there's DeviantArt.com, which is right. this massive community now of uh, artists from all over the world who are sharing what they do in um, dozens and dozens of categories. Mm -hmm. But there is a there are groups on DeviantArt, and one of the groups is the Cartography Guild group. And it's okay. a lot of the same people, but they're posting on DeviantArt as well because it lets you do all kinds of extra things like um, um, favoriting and um, there's, there's internal communications like in notices and uh, contests and all sorts of things on DeviantArt. So um, 
I'm on there. I've I've recently put up a couple of maps on DeviantArt, and um, I've been sort of lurking on Cartography Guild for a long time, just watching people uh, put up their cool stuff. Cool. And then I have my own site, um, my own website, where I'm sort of promoting. Uh, I have a blog and um, working on a novel, and that's just ChristianSteel.com. Um, the novel name is The Calligraphy of Demons, and I also have calligraphyofdemons.com, uh, which takes you to the novel page where you can get uh, free chapters and uh, even audiobook chapters where I've podcasted uh, some MP3s. Okay, so why don't you tell us a little bit, um, so uh, let's see, uh, process, of, process of making a map? For you? Is there a place you usually start, or can you start anywhere? Um. Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so a lot depends on, you know, what your purpose uh, for the map is, but um, a, a really basic idea for somebody who's like a, a fantasy author or a science fiction author would be uh, you want to lay down the contours of your world, um, your continents, your islands, um, where your major cities are. Uh, authors from Tolkien to Ursula Le Guin to Patrick, Patrick Rothfuss, um, they've all done this. Uh, mm -hmm. Even George R. R. Martin, um, the, somebody was saying, I was reading on a forum uh, like a month or two ago, how suspiciously, if you look at the maps of Westeros, uh, Westeros is if you take the continent uh, top to bottom and you sort of draw a line across the middle you can kind of see how the entire top part uh, fits on an 8.5 by 11 size and the entire <laughs> bottom part fits on an 8.5 by 11 size and uh, so it looks a lot like uh, he you know when one assumes that uh, George R. R. Martin, when he was sketching out Westeros, uh, just had a nice sheet of paper and just kind of drew drew out his coastline and threw down the the wall and put down King's Landing and all that stuff. <laughs> uh, it's it's pretty obviously everything is contained within that space. And if if you're making a map and you want to be as naturalistic as possible, you don't want to be quite that obvious that uh, you've filled in, you know, out to the corners of each uh, eight and a half by eleven sheet. Mm. But but most authors do this sort of thing and. Um, you want to, and there, there, there are lots of good reasons for that. You want to have a uh, vision for where your action is taking place. Uh, you want to keep things straight in your head about uh, when you, people are journeying from one city to another. You want to figure, okay, is it going to take them three days to get there or three weeks to get there? And, yeah. And, um, are they going to be slogging through a swamp when, uh, on the way or are they going to have to deal with snow or, you know, you have all these considerations and... Uh, so, like, I remember... How many rivers do they have to cross? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And, and then how do you cross the rivers, you know? So, some rivers are fordable in lots of places, and other rivers are pretty tough to get across. You know, they're pretty uh, major barriers, like the Rhine or something. Mm -hmm. um, so I remember uh, reading about Ursula Le Guin, who's... I'm a big fan of hers, uh, especially Me the Earth, Earth Sea Trilogy, mm -hmm. yeah. She's amazing, and I remember reading some stuff about uh, her working on her map for Earthsea and how she's, you know, just kind of doing it for fun, doing it uh, to draw out a place for her world. She's drawing out all these islands. She wanted, a, you know, archipelagos but no major continents. Um, and if you look at her map, uh, and I have... Yeah, I can throw it up here. Um, if you look at her map, she... Uh, you can tell that a lot of the names of the islands are a little funny. Like, uh, they're similar to each other. Like, uh, the East Reach has uh, Corp and Cop and Holp and Tok. And you, these are islands in, uh -huh. the, in the reach of her <coughs> world. And you can kind of tell that it, she's sort of making it up as she goes along. Uh, you know, she's 
she's sketching it out and then throwing down names for islands, and some of those islands uh, wind up in the novel. Um, do, are you able to see the Yeah, the, yeah, the we map? can see it now. So some of the islands may, make it into the novels, and some of them don't. I think this this map here, I think, is hers. I think this was sketched by her. The ones that got published um, in the books were based on her original sketched map, but were sort of traced over by slightly more professional um, graphic design artists in, back in the late 60s, early 70s, uh, back when you could only do line art in a paperback novel that's coming out. Mm -hmm. But, you know, she's, you can just imagine her sitting there with uh, her sheets of paper and just sketching out little islands and throwing down names for them. And then, as an author, when you do that, your imagination just kind of takes over and you start to imagine, well, this is where, this is where the dragons are going to live over here and, you know, down here is where uh, these strange people who live on, like, um, you know, floating rafts that are all tied together, they all live there. And then the, uh -huh. uh, the pale-skinned barbarian people live over here. Uh, you know, your, your imagination just kind of run, runs away like that. And it's a good way to do sort of interdisciplinary creativity when right. you're... Um, uh, when you're planning out, when you're doing your world building. Um, another thing that Ursula Le Guin did that I thought was pretty amazing, it just, I it just realized it today, was, uh, are you able to see, let's see, this. Um, the Labyrinth of the Tombs of Atuan. Mm -hmm. So... Oh, there it, it just, is, yep. It just occurred to me. I think Tombs of Atuan was published in like 69 or 70. Mm -hmm. And so here she is uh, putting out a novel, and she actually has a dungeon um, in the front of her novel. You know, it's she doesn't have the... Um, she, she has sort of a, a layout for the tomb complex with the temple and stuff, but then mm -hmm. she has the great labyrinthine dungeon down below, uh, and I think she might be one of the first people to actually like put a dungeon map into a novel. This is before Dungeons and Dragons even existed. Um, it was just a twinkle in Gary Gygax's eye at this point. <laughs> and, Maybe uh, a twinkle in his eye when he read The Tombs of Atuan, you never know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and so... You know, she's got. This isn't the the map that was there. Somebody's re redrawn this because this wasn't the one in the edition that I had. Um, right. So it's it's been it's been redone, but it's it's really important for the plot because uh, it's uh, you know there are events that take place in the novel that are it's very important as to uh, where the characters are at the time and um, keeping things straight about who's trapped in which room and, uh, you know, where uh, Tenar can look down through the hole and see and talk to people uh, right. who are trapped in the labyrinth below. You know, what else I loved about that um, map was it, look, it reminds me, of course, of a, of a maze that a child would try to, you know, get from point A to point B. Yeah. And it just, it totally makes me, makes me smile just to look at it. Like, I, it adds, like, another dimension uh -huh. to the story, uh, like a sense of joy, almost, um, just to see that. Uh, totally. That anyway, that's totally. what I... What so, I in, in terms of process, like, um, you know, the simplest thing is just grab a sheet of paper and a pencil and start sketching. A lot of people start that way. I started that way. Um, right. Most of the time these days, I start with uh, something else. I start in a digital form, like... Uh, I have an app called Procreate on my iPad, and it's a uh, sketching drawing app that is, I think, the best one available. And you're able to throw down layers there. You're able to redo and undo. You're able to, um, you know, uh, you know, fix mistakes, um, erase and un and and redraw things. And that's what I did, the, the maps that are posted on my site and uh, the map that I developed for my novel and the one that just won the contest recently. Uh, I did most of the drawing for that by hand in Procreate. 
But there are lots of um, drawing apps that you can use both on the iPad or uh, on your desktop. Like, um, there's lots of tutorials out there for drawing stuff in Photoshop uh, or using something like GIMP, which is free, you know, free version of Photoshop. Um, I do a lot in Illustrator as well because I I'm a graphic designer in my spare time and I um, I know Illustrator really well. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of a lot of techniques that you can do in Illustrator to keep things crisp and clean and uh, have everything spaced out the way you like them. Um, that's how I did the the map of the cloister on the uh, on the map that I recently posted. Uh -huh. um, the cloister buildings all laid out in Illustrator, and the great thing about YouTube in this in this era is that you can just search for tutorial map tutorial uh, fantasy map, and you can come up with dozens and dozens of people who have been really helpful um, in putting out advice on how to do stuff. Some of the people who are putting out the advice are the very people who are publishing maps like uh, Jonathan Roberts is uh, one of the prominent people these days. Um, Mike Schley is a prominent uh, map maker these days. And mm -hmm. so they do stuff like the... Um, there's a pack of maps that you can get if you're a fan of George R. R. Martin's Game of Thrones that is like all of Westeros, all of Essos, plus maps of the various cities like Bravos. Right. Uh, there's a huge map pack that's like 40 bucks, bunch of like 10 poster maps inside. It's absolutely gorgeous. And the, the very people who do those maps are putting out these uh, tutorials on YouTube for free or tutorials on their own sites for free, showing you, giving you advice, giving back to the community about how to, how they do their thing, you know. And um, you can do any level of professionalism that um, you want to if, if you have the time. If you're just doing something for your campaign, if you're a game uh, master, dungeon master, um, you want something that's good enough for your adventurers on Saturday nights or something, mm -hmm. or if you're or a fantasy novelist and you just want to throw <coughs> something down and you know later on when and you know hopefully your novel gets published, then you'll pay a professional cartographer to take what you've done and polish it up and make it look nicer. Um, you right. know, just dive in and start drawing, you know? Okay, so I wanted to show you. Can I show you something that I did? I, I, I've now figured out your screen share thing. Um, this is something I actually blogged about at one point, and it's like super ultra basic. I did a map in Excel. Oh, cool. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> like, if you don't have any fancy stuff and you have something that's roughly square, you can actually do this weird thing in Excel where you, um, where you make all of the, you basically make all of the boxes the same size, mm -hmm. and you can actually make a sort of a map. And this is gonna look a little funny, but <laughs> hey, hey, there you go. Hey. <laughs> so, um. It almost looks like it? Uh, it almost looks like Clue. To me. Well, it's, <laughs> it's the it's basically the suite uh, that my noble people live in, uh, and the reason that I had to map it was because, um, as you can probably tell, it's really complicated. Um, but the trick is, this is a. Uh, this is a place where these noble families live in these in these big suites and you can see the do you see the red wall yeah so the red wall is uh, the wall that divides the noble people's area from the surrounding area which is the servants area ah. and so I had to know basically I was writing the story and everything was kind of fine except I needed to know how people access the different rooms from the servant spaces. Yeah. Because I have servant characters as well as uh, noble characters. So a little like Downton Abbey, kind of. Um. Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, so the idea is that these servant spaces run all the way through... Um, they run all the way through this uh, 
place, and um, and fortunately, it, it you know I I didn't have it totally messed up, <laughs> uh, but it was it was nice to uh, it was nice to be able to tie some things down because I realized I had, for example, too many rooms on one side of the servants area. And oh, I yeah. had to say, actually, no, this person doesn't live in this area. He lives over here. Um, so he has access to these different areas. Um, but anyway, so so that's... So it reminds me a little bit of like the secret passages. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And you're yeah, trying to make do with what you've got, but uh, totally. People do. People use MS Paint. You know, people use um, free programs all the time for this sort of thing. Um, both free programs that are complex and free programs that are uh, really simple. You know, you can, like I said, you can you can use the GIMP, and the GIMP is totally free, and it has most of the pro uh, capabilities that Photoshop does. Mm -hmm. um, there's, uh, I think, Inkscape is. Uh, Illustrator, uh, like a free open source version of Illustrator, yeah, that, that you can use. And I'm learning Blender, which is a 3D modeling software similar to Maya or uh, 3D Studio. Blender, Max. what are you showing us? Oh, something I made with Gim. Oh, Gim. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Sweet. Yeah. It's uh, once I learned how to use layers. Maps got so much easier. Yeah. Is this this is for your for your novel? Yes, this is just a map to be a map. Just for fun, yeah. Yeah. A cool. lot of times to get started, one of the things I do is I go to Google Earth and I flip <laughs> north and south and zoom in on one particular area that interests me. Mm -hmm. And then. I invert land and water, so I might find a really interesting lake, mm. and then that becomes a continent. And I'll take a screenshot of that and and trace over it and get. That's a great method, yeah. Yeah. I've I've uh, I've come across tutorials like that on YouTube where um, that's what they recommended. They say you know go to Google Earth, uh, grab uh, three four different regions that look interesting to you. Uh, take your screenshots, bring them into GIMP or Photoshop, and just sort of layer them over each other so that you wind up with a coastline that's uh, completely imaginary, but it's all based on uh, real eroded, um, you know, actual coastline that nature really worked on. So it looks really natural, but doesn't actually exist anywhere, so nobody's going to nail you on having And I think that's actually it. a really good point. I mean, when we're world building, we often will take uh, elements of geography or culture or whatever it is from the real world and translate them into our own world. And it's a mashup. It makes sense to do it. Uh, it makes sense to do it with maps as well. Yeah. So you're you're mashing it up just the way you the same way that you mash up um, ideas about uh, cultures in your fantasy world mm -hmm. where you, you want to have uh, Dothraki who are kind of Mongolian but not quite you know and <laughs> so you, you you have or or the um, I'm reading R Scott Backer right now so the Skilvendi uh, I think are kind of Mongolian as well mm -hmm. uh, but you know they're they're inspired by but not carbon copies of so they're they have different aspects thrown <clears throat> in and as an author you show your creativity by how uh, deftly you can mash these things together um, right. without without showing the fingerprints or the footprints that you're leaving behind and yeah. as a as a map maker there's a lot of the same artistry is um, being able to put elements in there that look really good on a map but not have it be so obvious that you're having it based on you know the island of Borneo or something like that. Well, it was, it was interesting Janice Hardy when she was doing the Healing Wars series um, basically her world building took uh, essentially Venice and uh, put it in Lake Victoria in Africa. Ooh. Uh, so that the climate was African, but the rough geography of the city was like that of Venice. It turned out to be kind of an interesting combination. Um, you know, That's and you get cool. things like ferry boat accidents and, and that sort of thing.
to. Yeah, Lake Victoria is huge. Yeah, well, exactly. <laughs> it's, it's, a huge, it's a huge place. So, Speaking uh, of Venice, um, what's his name? Scott Lynch, uh, Lies of Loch Lamora, mm. uh, and Red Red Seas Under Red Skies, and uh, Republic of Thieves. But Lies of Loch Lamora especially is based in a city called Camor, and Camor is is very obviously Venice-like because it has all these canals uh, mm -hmm. and all these bridges over the canals and. Uh, he has a map at the beginning of the book, which I found a little disappointing. I mean, I'm not knocking him at all uh, mm -hmm. because, you know, he's a good writer and I don't know how much cartographic <laughs> skill he has, but it's basically uh, the map shows, if you can Google it, like Map of Camor, um, the map shows just a bunch of shapes that rep represent the islands uh, that make up the city. Mm -hmm. And it shows like, okay, here's this canal, here's the river going through the city. Uh, but there's no more detail than that. You know, there's just some words like, this is the place where the cemetery is, and this is the place where the palace is. And you, you get nice descriptions, you know, in the novel for you know, what the cemetery area looks like and what the palace looks like. Uh, so that's that's good, and it's nice to have sort of a layout to show you where things are relative to each other. But for me, I'm, I'm always hoping for something that looks really pretty, you know, something that looks really like you could just dive in, jump into the... Um, jump into the place. Like, there are right. maps for Ankh-Morpork, uh, Terry Pratchett's great city... Uh, that looks a lot like uh, medieval London. Um, over the years, you know, he's done so many books in Ankh Morpork that um, he's had some really professional artists create these maps that look like you could just step foot in them. There's even an iPad app that's a little overpriced, I think, uh, but mm -hmm. that is a, like a living map of Ankh Morpork where you can zoom in and zoom in and zoom in and you can see little people walking the streets and hear them mumbling to each other in like cockney slang and How funny. Um, yeah it's uh, that that sort of thing i'm always uh, i'm always hoping for that level of professional um, uh, beautiful stuff and not not every author can really afford to do that, and not every publisher sees the value in that. And I realize that may be idiosyncratic to me, but I want to have I want to have a map that looks really nice uh, on on my novel when it comes out, and right. I have the ability to actually um, to draw that. So that's one of the things I'm working on. Mm -hmm. So, like, um, uh, yeah, Karen, no. do you have any questions or anything that you'd like to? bring in? Um, I was thinking, you know, when maps are especially important to include in a novel, uh, and I was thinking of the works of China Mayville, mm -hmm. um, and how he's so, all of his uh, books involve usually placed as a, you know, like its own character, um, like City in the City is one, and Perdido Street Station, and these are all, and I'm, I just, but I can't recall that I saw maps in his work, and I was just a curious if Christian, I don't did know you if you're find, familiar. Did you find a lack um, as I, you were reading that there I, uh, wasn't a map? You know, I, looking back on it, I think I would have really enjoyed that. I didn't really think about it at the time. Um, I think I'm not, I don't expect so much when I pick up um, like an adult uh, fantasy book. I remember as a child <laughs> reading books that always had maps like Anne McCaffrey's World, Dragon Riders, um, mm -hmm. the yeah. um, Piers Anthony. When I was into his fantasy <laughs> book, had he just he just Florida. used yes, Zanth, He just used a map of Florida, and I was just, I always studied those so much. <laughs> Lake Ogre like Toby. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and I found them all. I remember being really, you know, finding that all wonderful. I don't know if I have any questions so much as those are my comments and well, what. That yeah. That actually sparks something um, that I wanted to to mention, which is I've I've read a couple of sort of rants recently online about mm -hmm. uh, maps in fantasy novels, uh, maps as in the map is a uh, cliche, 
Like, there are people who say, oh, I'm, if I pick up a fantasy novel, this, if I see that there's a map, the first thing, I put it down. Because that's just more Tolkien, you know, uh, C.S. Lewis, Narnia junk that... Um, Obviously, that's just genre stuff that's showing no creativity, and therefore, yeah. um, <clears throat> th therefore, it's not worth my time. If, if the author can't describe the world well enough for me to imagine it, then, you know, I, it's not it's not worth me reading. And I just uh, I found that a really paper thin argument that um, that I had answers to. You know, I, I think that uh, in speculative fiction especially in secondary world uh, fantasy and yes. science fiction. Uh, a map is not absolutely essential, but can be very, very important because there's so much that we take for granted about the real world. And our background knowledge of the way the real world is laid out and the way um, cities relate to each other the way uh, Europe has a climate like this, Afri Africa has a climate like that. There are all these things that we completely take for granted that an author doesn't need to explain that they can just use because they know that they're writing a book for fellow Earthlings who are going to know these things. And as a fantasy author, secondary world fantasy author, um, you really need to bootstrap your story by throwing some of that background in. You need to uh, show where things are laid out or else you're going to... Th there are consequences for not doing that, like the consequence being uh, a lack of engagement from your reader. Um, the reader might get frustrated and you, you, they're juggling like five different cities in their head and not really understanding where the cities are, and then you say, well, it took them a week to sail from place to place, and you're like, well, wait, sail? Why did they have to sail? I thought they walked last time. And if you don't yeah. have a map, um, then that sort of little thing can get in the way. It can get between your reader and the enjoyment of your story. Well, so, and I think also yeah. there's another factor involved here, which is that... Um, uh, I think to you have a, a, a world-building aspect when you're making a map the same way that you have it when you're making a story. And what makes a clear difference between one story and the other uh, in terms of world-building, you also have to reflect that in your map. So if you're actually, if you have world-building and it's super similar to Tolkien, well, gosh, it's super similar to Tolkien. If you have a map but your world is not similar to Tolkien, then you shouldn't use the same kind of visual vocabulary in your map that Tolkien does in his maps. Like the same style? Um, right, like there should be ways to show a distinction between a Tolkien world or a Tolkien-esque world and a non-Tolkien-esque world in a map. Yeah, it's one of the big ways that you can quickly signal that your world is different. Uh, is, you know, we, we get so much information from these visual cues uh, that, you know, are kind of smuggled in that um, mm -hmm. we don't think about explicitly a lot of the time. As a graphic <laughs> designer, you're, you're supposed to think about these things explicitly, but uh, a lot of people... Um, you know, are just absorbing the information without actually thinking about it, and that's one of the things that you can get across with a map and with a with a distinct visual style, like uh, the style of your cover art, um, the style of uh, certain weapons or or uh, costumes or armor in your world. You know, you might describe them a certain way, and then you might get uh, somebody like Picaccio or uh, Whalen to actually illustrate that on your cover and then for the next 20 or 30 years uh, that's your distinct visual style for your world you know kind right. of the way Robin Hobb has the uh, Assassin's uh, Farseer um, trilogy stuff and Mike Whalen did the cover art for that and so you have this sort of vision of what um, 
the characters look like in okay. that in that world. And then the like the gorgeous cover art for um, the Republic of Thieves, uh, Scott Lynch's recent novel um, that just came out last year. Just, I mean, I've I've been staring at that cover art for like two years because the cover art was released long before the novel was, and it's just so striking. Um, very Venice, uh, very Italian, sort of Commedia dell'arte kind of look with uh, masks uh, on a couple of characters who are prominently in the front of this sort of um, Venetian or Florentine kind of city. Just absolutely gorgeous uh, cover art. But when you have a, a graphic like that that's that effective, it, it really seeps into your reader especially if they have a hard copy, especially if they're picking up the book all the time, staring at it, absorbing it, and your map can be a part of that. Your map um, orients your reader and gives them a feel for your world. Uh, yeah, that's what I was going to throw in, too, is just information in general. You can have a lot of visual information on the map that would be very tedious and bogged down the story to tell totally. the words. Like yep. if you had to explicitly say that, oh, this city is northwest of the other city and it's a so many kilometer journey. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, that reminds me of something. Um, uh, one of the points, I think, of the people who are ranting about the maps was something along the lines of um, if there's going to be a map, it should only be there for an organic reason, like... Uh, in The Hobbit, uh, Tolkien could claim, hey, this is Thror's map that Thorin has because Gandalf got Oh, I got see. It like a, a story but, internal map that yeah. would exist within the story frame. Okay. It's an internal map. So it's like, yeah, of course, here's the Lonely Mountain and here's the uh, you know drawing of, of the hand pointing at the secret spot spot on the side of the Lonely Mountain where the thrush is going to knock and here are the the runes in the moon letters that are going to appear when Elrond holds it up to the light you know um, that's an internal map that's internal to the story I think they were ranting partially about well wait a minute why is there you know some map just sitting here that looks all um, old-timey with uh, you know um, parchment kind of background when uh, there's no actual map referenced in the novel, referenced in the story at all. And well, I don't know about whether kind of it needs to be referenced in the story, but I could certainly see an argument where uh, <clears throat> you want to make sure that the visual vocabulary of your map matches the vocabulary you're using to describe in the, in the book. Yeah. You know, if there's yeah. no such thing as parchment in your world, you'd hate to have a parchment-looking map. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know. And so I, I could kind of see a little bit of an argument there, but uh, yeah, in terms of in that, it, it reminds me of uh, the way that if your map looks different from the world you're creating, like if you have a medieval fantasy world and your map doesn't look very medieval, yeah, uh, that would be uh, throwing you out of the atmosphere the same way that somebody using a um, anachronistic word in dialogue in your novel throws people mm -hmm. out of the atmosphere that you're creating. So, yeah, it's it probably should all be of a piece, you know, it should all it should all kind of um, the themes should mesh together and and uh, feel like they belong together. Right. That's why my maps look kind of parchmenty. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, well, okay. So I'm going to ask a map question, and I don't know uh, how ha whether you'll be interested in answering it. But um, uh, let's say that you have a uh, I have a really challenging map uh, problem in uh, in the same world that I did the the building, the, the, the house map in. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is that I have a city that is uh, an underground city with multiple levels. And I have a concept of certain areas of the cities 
and I have a concept of the difference between the si the relative size of the different levels and how sort of what they look like, you know, how high the ceilings are at various spots and, mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. But when it comes to trying to map it, I'm baffled how to get the different layers to sort of lie over each other and see... Do you know what I'm saying? I totally do, yeah. Um, how would you I, approach a problem like that? That's the sort of thing I love to do. Um, I have um, I, I have something similar in my world, a, a city that's built on the remains of other cities <laughs> below it, and so uh, there's like underground streets and then above ground yeah. streets and stuff. Uh, and the way um, the way that I've seen that I think done most effectively is this is the way I would tackle that project. I would have uh, top down uh, one layer at a time maps of uh, you know surface street and then uh, first layer beneath and then second layer beneath, for instance. Mm -hmm. And then I would take those and I would uh, put them together in an isometric view, which is uh, like a 45 degree angle view. If you take your, if you take a top down image, and uh, you, in Illustrator or Photoshop or whatever you have, uh, if you take that and you squish it in the vertical direction, right. but not in horizontal, what you wind up with is something, if you go down to about 57.7%, that's about the right amount for what becomes isometric perspective. Um, so that's you, what you're talking about when, for example, the last map you showed, where you felt like you were looking at the mountain sideways a little bit, Yeah. even though you could see the total contour of the continent. Yeah, and... Um, <clears throat> isometric, what isometric does for you is you know, a, a normal, like if you were, say, uh, looking at the city of Paris from a balloon at uh, 3,000 feet or something, you're looking at it from a perspective at that point. So mm -hmm. the stuff that's uh, closer to you, the buildings that are closer to you, uh, you know, the, the angles kind of spread out towards you, the buildings that are further away, the angles will uh, recede away from you towards vanishing points. With mm -hmm. isometric, what that literally means is that um, the measurements are the same. So you don't have actual perspective, you have like an illusionary kind of, I'm looking at things from 45 degrees down, uh, floating above it as if I'm sort of godlike and I can see everything without having anything go to a vanishing point. Um, mm. That's it's a useful perspective for mapping. It doesn't because it doesn't look totally realistic. It helps you uh, have a sense of place where things are, and so if you imagine like uh, having a, a a square in your in your world, and you rotate it say 45 degrees to a diamond shape, and then you squish the horizontal down to 57.7 degrees then you get this diamond shape that can then be uh, rotated in either direction and assembled together into a hexagon. That's an isometric perspective. If you multiply those hexagons across the field, uh, you, dr you draw lines along the lines of the hexagons, along the lines of the little diamonds, uh, you'll wind up with uh, what people see as an isometric perspective of a city or um, a building or something. So the way I would tackle your thing would be to take those top-down maps, mm -hmm. assuming we have them, uh, mm -hmm. orient them, you know, <coughs> probably at a 45 degree angle, squish them down to 57.7 degrees, and then stack them in, in an image so you have like layer one, layer two, layer three, and then uh, draw connections uh, showing like, okay, here's a here's a shaft of a well that goes from the surface down to level two, and people could uh, climb the rope down the well, and mm -hmm. down on level two there'd be like a little pool of water that uh, the well would be drawing from, and you'd have like um, dash, dash, dash uh, showing 
how the invisible well shaft uh, connects from one level to the other level down below. Um, and then have the stacked up layers. And if there's enough little connections here and there, and there's enough uh, sort of hinting about uh, the three-dimensional nature of each room, like say you have like a, say a, a big uh, hall with pillars or something, mm -hmm. you'd have uh, the floor plan of the hall would be there in your isometric perspective, and then you'd maybe have some uh, sort of pillars that look solid at the base and then kind of taper up into invisibility towards the top of the pillars. So that, when people look at that, that's a kind of technique that artists have used, map makers have used for a long time. People on um, uh, National Geographic use it all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, that gives you a real sense, like, oh, this is a 3D thing that I'm looking at. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at a 3D thing. Uh, the front wall is invisible, obviously. The ceiling is invisible, obviously. But the rear wall is kind of not fully invisible. It's, you know, mm -hmm. semi-opaque, especially down near the bottom. And right. it, as an artist, uh, that sort of technique can really put your viewer, your reader, right into the city um, and make them feel like, ah, I, I, I totally get it. I see how these layers are stacked on top of each other and uh, mm -hmm. ev everything lines up, you know? Like this, this big domed this big domed room down on level two, the dome is so high that uh, there aren't any streets there on level one because they would intersect with the dome. Or if they did intersect, uh -huh. they would go to like a mezzanine that would circle the dome at that point. You know, that sort of thing. Right. Um, yeah, I see it all. <laughs> um, that's, that's, that's the way I would do it. That's the way I, I've, I've been doing um, that sort of thing. Uh, I'll, I'll find, while you guys are talking, I'll find a, an image of uh, the city I have, sort of an isometric perspective of the city, that uh, one of the cities I'm working on. Uh, one thing I'd ask Juliet is, did that answer your question, or were you at a more basic level of, of just how to, in making your individual level maps, make sure they line up properly? Um, well, I mean, I've, I've kind of, I think that answered my question. Uh, it gave me a, certainly a way to think about it. Uh, th this particular city is, 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 relies on a great deal of, of, of deep rock uh, because all of, this, all of the ceilings are very, very high. Um, not on every level, but um, pretty much is a, is a very, very deep city, basically. <laughs> and there isn't a lot of uh, interlevel interference, though you've gotten me thinking about whether there might be uh, places where there was interlevel interference. Um, but it's a, it's a high-tech environment, so a lot of the... Um, uh, so a lot of the... Um, uh, Sorry, am I distracted? Yeah, no problem. <laughs> uh, it's a high-tech environment, so... They they have reinforced the rock uh, in in very specific ways so that you can have a ceiling and underneath it you can have buildings. There you go. Um, yeah. You know, it's it's a little bit like City of Ember, I I guess, um, ex except that the ceilings would be a yeah, you know, it depends on on the level, but so it would be a little bit like City of Ember, only only multiple levels and high and higher technology. That's cool. All right, so can you guys see this? <laughs> yeah. So yeah. this is sort of the beginnings of a map, but um, what you have here is um, the city of Tun in in my world. You've got it's it's on a peninsula between these two rivers <coughs> that are coming together here. This is the isometric perspective. Uh, mm -hmm. looking down on the city. And the, the idea of the city is that um, it's the, the people of Tun uh, know how to use uh, runes that strengthen their architecture. And there's a sort of a cyclical uh, apocalyptic thing that happens in the world where um, the city gets sort of burnt and raised uh, every couple thousand years. And when people return to the city, they find uh, the ruins of the level below 
uh, are so robust. They're so um, there's they've been strengthened by the magic that still exists to uh, to the point where it's more practical just to build a new city on top of the ruins rather than tearing the ruins down and mm. rebuilding. And so this has happened like seven times. So what you're seeing is uh, seven cities built on top of each other uh, stacking up. And the people keep coming back to this region because it's such a uh, natural defensive point, such a, a good place to have a city. So they keep returning and they keep rebuilding the city. So you have this um, this look of the city like this where if I can zoom in here and uh, you guys let me know. Is it zooming? Yes. yes. Okay, good. So I did this in Illustrator even though it looks fairly 3D. And you can see how big it is. Like, uh, this is the scale here. 1,300 feet or so is, is this uh, okay. orange bar. And then you can see here's a nice, big, tall um, wall city, uh, walling off the sort of dockside area and another wall walling off that area. And then you can see how, uh, over the years, they've built this sort of winding road that takes you up to the top level of the city. Mm. Um, and then <clears throat> with this technique I use, I can also um, do it so that it goes to this. Um, I can do you know whatever uh, alternate view I want. So you can see this view now, same same city but seen from the different angle. Mm -hmm. um, so you can see how there's like a little dockside area over here, and then. So this is all just an illustrator uh, done with uh, blending uh, tools and stuff. But uh, this is sort of the seed for what will eventually become uh, a nice pretty map once I sort of paint over it and draw over it. But um, I have maps, uh, to your idea, Julia, um, mm -hmm. I have maps of like what the tunnels are like, what the streets are like underneath in several of these layers. Oh, okay. Um, like I have maps of the surface street and then this level underneath is called Pelham Cestus and it's uh, it's got a bunch of tunnel streets where people uh, do a lot of the dirty work sort of um, uh, black market sort of dealings down there because there are you know hundreds of hundreds of uh, hatches and um, staircases and things that lead down into that level and then the third level, I also use this in my D&D campaign, uh, the third level is called the Demon Tombs right now, and that's where there's all these um, stuff from this ancient civilization with lots of nasty Cthulhu-like monsters, and uh, mm -hmm. my, my players have been down there getting um, attacked by tentacles and things. Uh, so... The, the kind of project you're talking about, um, it's right up my alley because that's the sort of thing I'm doing already with this. And I, right. I could see putting that together. This is, I made the city a little big. It's, it's pretty gigantic um, in terms of like what a medieval city would be. But uh, right. it, it would be more manageable if I didn't uh, go overboard all the time and make things uh, big. <laughs> Bigger than they should be. Well, you know, go overboard. <laughs> Why not? Well, I, we're about out of time. Um, any last minute questions? Um, Make maps. Okay. <laughs> wow, that, that was fascinating, Christian. Thank you for coming and, and showing us all those cool uh, things and Happy teaching to me do how it. to share images <laughs> on my on my uh, hangout. And it's cool, um, huh? Yeah, yeah, you know, now I know how to do it. Wee. <laughs> and um, I want to just put it out there. If, if anybody has questions about um, how to do this or that or how, how I would do this or that, it uh, mm -hmm. needs advice, feel free to contact me, uh, either Facebook or Twitter or just on my site, christiansteel.com. Okay. Um, and and if anybody's interested in um, commissioning me to do work for them, I'm I'm open to doing that sort of thing, so feel free. Possibly, Thank possibly. You. I don't. Uh, I'll think about it because uh, definitely intrigued by what you were saying. So, yeah, I'm really going to have to think about what you were describing. How to do the isometric view? I, 
I'm going to put that a was... tutorial out there uh, on that because it, it took me some experimenting to figure out how to make it work, and uh, now I have a really easy process to make it work. So I can show you how to create a, an image like the one I was just showing you of the you know three dimensional city. All right, super. Well, thank you so much. I'm gonna stop the broadcast at this point, and we can continue com conversing afterwards. But uh, thanks to viewers who may or may not stop in, and uh, we'll see you next week.